Please, John. Actually, I have two small presentations to do. The first one is uh, a new module that uh, the Landstar people have come up with called the Dense Cataract Measurement Mode, the DCM mode. And uh, I have no financial interest. When you do a standard measurement with the A-scan algorithm, every A-scan is a composite of 16 single scans. The parallel to the A-scan, I should collect information of the K readings, white to white, and the pupillometry. So when you do an A-scan, it takes the first measurement, the second measurement, the third measurement, fourth measurement, and then you get the algorithm of your uh, scan, the cornea, the anterior lens spike, the posterior lens spike, and the retina in the back. The signal always occur in the same position. So you have, when you get more than multiple A scan, if you're gonna put them on top of each other, they're gonna have to fit in the same position. So if you, they do, then the corneal spike will be definitely where it is, the posterior cornea spike will be right in here. We're focusing on the cornea in here. And the noise, which is random, tends to cancel itself out, so you can only get the uh, actual scans. So the signal is increasing, the noise is diminishing, and you get smooth A scan with clear signals. So in patients with dense cataract or pronounced posterior subcapsular changes, a composite of the 16 single scan might not be sufficient to have a good scan. So this is where the DCM mode comes in. And you notice that in here, you get all of a sudden a good retinal spikes because you have five of 16 scans, that means 60 of them, on top of each other that will allow you destroy the noise and give you a better scanning. So with the standard axial length scan, every measurement is composed of 16 scans. With the DCM, it takes five times the 16 scans, 80 scans. Uh, so, but it uses the same basic technology. So this is the results of my data. With a, we took the uh, 477 measurements that were done. And with the, with the regular algorithm, I had a 6.3% where I could not use the measurements. And when we use the DCM algorithm, it brought it down to 2.7. So on my personal data, we had a 50% improvement in the measurements of the axial length. I'm going to show you the few cases where I thought that the DCM makes a big difference. The first one is when there is a patient movement with patient motion. Many of these older people have Parkinson's or have different things, and when they sit behind the machine and they have movement, you get scans like that, and you really don't know which one to use, and many of time the measurements is completely off. But with the DCM, it gives you the scan, and you know exactly where it is. The second one is if you have a high standard deviation. And uh, that makes a big difference. I remember very vividly this patient because the, my technician came in and said that this uh, right eye measurement is totally different than the left eye. And at that time, I noticed that there is the fifth one measurements was in front of it because the machine was focused more on the technician, focused on the lens instead of the cornea. And I made him repeat it with immersion ultrasound, and I'm glad I did not use the 26 diopter, I used the 23.5. But had I had the DCM at the time, it would have shown me immediately that the measurement is here, and it would have made the correct measurement. So this is a very important point. The case number three is really if you have a very low signal. Many times with the dense cataract, the retinal signal is so small that it's very hard for you to say yes, this is the one I want to use. Even if you get measurements in here, you have some doubts whether it is true or not. But with the DCM, you get a higher spike and you know exactly that this is the thing. The fourth place where I find it very important is a low signal in a long eye. The most frustrating patients are those who have very long eyes and they develop posterior subcapsular changes and they become very, very difficult to find the retinal spike and do a correct measurement. But with the DCM, it makes it a little bit easier 
to find and to calculate. So in summary, the DCM mode creates a composite of all the scans that are available. It's automatically activated if there is no axial length available after three measurements. And I would like to see it activated all the time, but I think there is some problems with that. But the DCM could improve the non-measurement rate, but at least more than 50% of the times. You go from this scan to this scan. And so the cataract penetration capability of the lens star was already good, but with the DCM mode, it's even better. Now, they gave me to talk about two subjects. The second subject I would like to talk very dear to my heart is the IOL power calculation in eyes with previous hyperopic LASIK. Uh, the article has already been published in the Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery not too long ago. And I would like to thank my co-authors, my daughter Maya and Dr. Hill, who's present here, and who was published in the Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery a couple of months ago. In my opinion, there are more patients now in their 40s, 50s, and 60s that are having hyperopic LASIK to achieve better distance vision or even monovision. They ask you for keep one eye for distance, and they want a hyperopic LASIK on the other one to become more myopic so they can have one eye for distance, one eye for reading. We know that after myopic LASIK, if a conventional formula is used, like the HIGIS, Hoffer Q, Holiday, or SRKT, the patient will end up with postoperative hyperopia. Theoretically, after hyperopic LASIK, if a conventional formula is used, the opposite should happen, and the patient will end up with the postoperative myopia. So correcting the error when the LASIK data is available after myopic LASIK, there are multiple formulas that are available. After hyperopic LASIK, there are fewer formulas. And the best reference at the present time, in my opinion, is the ASCRIS website calculator, which is fantastic. However, if the LASIK data is not available, after myopic LASIK, the two most popular formula is mine and Dr. Heiges L formula. And both formula use a corneal correction equation to correct for the measurement error induced by the LASIK procedure. After hyperopic LASIK, it's important to remember that a different corneal correction equation is required. It's not the same as after myopic LASIK. So what we did as a study design, we had 42 eyes with prior hyperopic LASIK that underwent cataract surgery, 18 eyes with where we knew the previous LASIK data, and 24 eyes we had no previous LASIK data. So first, we established the corneal correction equation. To do that, we took the 18 eyes with previous LASIK data, and for each eye, we calculate the amount of LASIK correction at the corneal plane, not in the, not in the glasses, at the corneal plane, by subtracting the post-LASIK uh, post refraction at the cornea from the pre-LASIK refraction at the cornea. So for each eye, then we have the chance to compare the corrected K, which is what the K reading should have been after the hyperopic LASIK, with what you measured, the measured K after LASIK. And we ended up with this beautiful graph and a regression equation, which becomes the corneal correction. And this is the corneal correction equation that is to be used after hyperopic LASIK. And put it with the formula, that's the way it becomes. So to evaluate the formula, we tested it on the 18 eyes with previous LASIK data and on the 24 eyes with no previous LASIK data. And in each eye, we calculate what we call the predictive refractive error. That means we take the actual measured refraction after the surgery and we subtract it from the predicted refraction that the formula gave us. And we look at the different uh, parameters, the mean absolute error, plus standard deviation, and you, you see that we did fairly well compared to the other formulas that are available with prior LASIK data. We look at the median absolute error. The absolute errors do not follow a Gaussian curve. You cannot do a mean absolute error. You have to do a median absolute error and compare them. And we look, of course, at the range of the error. And if you look at the eyes within half a diopter and the eyes within one diopter, we fared really well compared to the other formulas. Then we evaluated the formula's accuracy in all 42 eyes 
with or without the prior LASIK data, our mean absolute error was not too bad at all. The median absolute error was very close to the highest L. The range was very much the same. And within plus minus one diopter was really good. So there are, in my opinion, there are three facts after hyperopic LASIK. First, the effect of hyperopic LASIK on the corneal power is lower than the effect of the myopic laser because the hyperopic laser you're treating at the periphery much more than in the center. And the difference is humongous, like uh, almost a quarter to one and a quarter, the difference between the two. The amount of hyperopic laser correction is usually lower than myopic. Most likely, patients with hyperopic LASIK, you do like two diopters, three diopters, while myopic, myopic patients, you go four, five, six diopters. The average was two versus four. And there is a third fact that we always have to take into consideration. Two key readings of the same eye taken at different times with the same machines, any machine you want, can vary by as much as half a diopter. So the question becomes, is a corneal correction needed after hyperopic laser for our power calculation? So we looked at the median absolute error with and without the corneal correction equation. And we found that if the correction was less than one and a half diopters, the difference between the two was very, very minute. While if it is over one and a half diopter of correction, the median absolute error dropped from 0 0.57 to 0 0.49. So in conclusion, I feel like the uh, Shamas post-hyperopic LASIK formula improves the IOL power calculation in eyes that had prior hyperopic LASIK, whether the amount of LASIK correction is known or not, and then the use of the Shamas PHL formula becomes more critical if the amount of hyperopic LASIK correction exceeds one and a half diopter. And I thank you for your attention. Uh, the Academy asked me to write a focal points uh, for them. It's a big honor, and it was on IOL calculation in patients with prior corneal reflective surgery. It is accessible uh, from the academy, and I thank you for your attention.